It's an issue with powerful emotions on both sides. Should the state be in the business of executing killers? You have killed somebody that I love. I have the opportunity to put you to death. There have been 150 people exonerated from death row. We make mistakes. It is the most difficult decision I ever make whether to pursue the death penalty. But as a prosecutor, I don't have the power to put anybody on death row. It takes 12 jurors. This hour, we're at the auditorium of the Plaza branch of the Kansas City Public Library, where we're partnering with the American Public Square in a debate over the death penalty. We'll hear more from proponents and opponents in just a moment. But first, a quick status report. Tonight, Kansas has 10 inmates on its death row. Missouri, 26. In fact, in the last few years, only Texas has outpaced Missouri in the number of prisoners it has put to death. But that number has slowed to a trickle as the state faces a barrage of legal challenges over its lethal injection procedure. The execution of a convicted murderer in Missouri is on hold this morning amid the growing debate over lethal injection. Attorneys for a man on death row are asking the U.S. Supreme Court to block the Missouri execution scheduled this week based on an argument stating the death penalty is unconstitutional. Neighboring Kansas, meanwhile, has not executed anyone in 50 years. And now a new effort underway to repeal the law entirely. Hello, I'm Nick Haynes. The death penalty has always been bubbling below the surface as a contentious issue in America. But right now, it's never out of our area headlines. In Missouri, the Court of Appeals just ruling that the state can keep secret the source of its lethal injection drugs. In Kansas, hearings in the last few weeks on a bill to repeal the death sentence 23 years after it was reinstated. And this weekend, the Lyric Opera decides to tackle the issue. Remember the movie Dead Man Walking? Well, get ready for the Kansas City premiere of Dead Man Walking the Opera. Before we launch into our debate, KCPT's Randy Mason takes us behind the scenes of the new show, hoping to prod Kansas Cityans into a conversation about the death penalty. You have the murder is shown in the beginning, so the audience is seeing the murder, sees who does it, wants to see him get justice, and the journey then for everyone is to then go into... The speaker? None other than Sister Skype Helen Prejean. Skyped in for a gathering of the Kansas City Star FYI Book Club, which has been reading her 1993 memoir. The one that spawned the 1995 movie starring Susan Sarandon and Sean Penn. And maybe most surprisingly, in 2000, an opera composed by Jake Heggie. The lyricism of our art form elevates the story to a new place. And I think Sister Helen would say that as well. When she was approached by Jake, Sister Helen said, well, I don't know a whole bunch about opera, but I don't want any of that modern stuff. I want people to come and to hear it and to leave being able to hum something. This is an opera that's had a lot of productions, and I think that it has deserved this place in our literature because it is such a gripping, compelling piece of musical storytelling. When we do contemporary opera, we talk about stories that are relevant to us now. And the truth is, opera has always done that. We did The Marriage of Figaro earlier this year. That is a political opera, and this is one too. Maybe things are more comfortable if they're 200, 250 years ago, but we're taking an opportunity to say to people, hey, what we do on the stage is part of everyday life. Opera does big emotions oh, yeah. really, really well. What bigger emotions can you get than what's in this book? Yeah. Book Club at the Opera Shop is just one of numerous ways the lyric has been trying to engage people around dead man walking, perhaps even spur them to attend a performance. One thing's for sure, capital punishment is a very good discussion starter. Suddenly, the, 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 the perpetrator of the crime isn't an animal, it's a human being. People who are well off are not on death row. They have to, like, almost become mechanized to push themselves Robotic. away from what they're doing. You know, I don't want him to die, but then she kept reminding me the pain he caused and the victims, the pain they're still experiencing. 
Literature does not shy away from difficult topics, and films don't shy away from difficult topics. One may walk away with more sort of ambiguity around the topic than they walked in with. It's very easy to say things are black or white, but they're really not. It's one of the lessons of the opera. Executions are slowing down all across the country. In 1999, 98 prisoners were put to death. Last year, the number was 20. So is the death penalty dying and why? For Platte Pro County Prosecutor Eric Zahn, the decision as to whether to pursue the death penalty is the most important decision a prosecutor ever makes. He's currently weighing up the death penalty as we speak in a quadruple murder case where a Platte County man is alleged to have shot and then set on fire his grandparents, his sister, and his nephew. Next to Eric is the Reverend Adam Hamilton, founding pastor at the Church of the Resurrection in Leewood, Kansas. Why is he here? Well, he's still praying on that, but two compelling reasons, ladies and gentlemen. He wrote the book Confronting the Controversies, Biblical Perspectives on Tough Issues, including a whole chapter on the death penalty. He's also recently hired an associate pastor at the church who was convicted of murder and exonerated after 24 years in prison. To the right of me is Tricia Bushnell. She is the director of the Kansas City-based Midwest Innocent Project, a not-for-profit corporation dedicated to the investigation, litigation, and exoneration of wrongfully convicted men and women in our five-state region, which includes Kansas and Missouri. Now, how the death penalty is playing out politically is changing throughout the country, so flying in, from Washington, D.C., is longtime political consultant and Republican strategist Terry Nelson. He's the former political director of the Bush Cheney campaign. Please welcome our panel, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> in 1999, 98 executions in America. Last year, just 20. In 1998, 295 people sentenced to death in America. Last year, just 30 were. Eric, what has changed? Well, I think several things have changed. First, we have to acknowledge that there is evolving public opinion on the death penalty. That has led to, to one important thing, and that is prosecutors being more selective when they apply the death penalty. The other thing is that defense attorneys are trying very, very hard to make the death penalty so expensive so difficult to carry out that no prosecutor in his or her right mind would ever try to do it. I did notice in a Supreme Court case last year, they were talking about the time from sentence to execution today in America is nearly 18 years. Yeah, and, and in fact, in the most recent case, the most recent person to be executed in the state of Missouri, it took 19 years. In the two years of 2014 and 2015, Missouri executed 16 prisoners. Last year, one. So why? It's a lot of reasons, actually. So some of what we see is the recognition that comes partly from the wrongful conviction movement that we make mistakes. So there is some recognition of perhaps we shouldn't be using this ultimate penalty that we can't come back from, right? So yes, some prosecutors are definitely looking at things and saying it's taking a long time and shying away from it. Uh, and that's happening. It's happening because 68% of all death penalty convictions, all people sentenced to death, 68% of them have their death sentences overturned by an appellate court later. That's why it takes 18 years. You know, two thirds of everyone sentenced to death is not gonna end up on death row. So why is it even useful to do? It's costing us an extraordinary amount of money. There's been a strong movement to become smarter on crime, right? Um, and, and, and I think we see that in Nebraska, where recently the conservative movement voted, the legislators voted to repeal the death penalty. Um, that repeal was eventually repealed for a variety of reasons. I'd love to hear some of our other panelists talk about but people are starting to see we make mistakes. Humans make mistakes and we can't fix them. I know it, it seems hard to believe when you see other states are, have been looking to repeal the death penalty. In this neck of the woods, though, Terry Nelson, flying in from Washington, D.C., it's hard to find even some prominent Democrats who actually support repealing the death penalty. In Missouri, we had a Democratic governor, Jay Nixon, who didn't even show clemency to those who were on death row. Even an attorney general, a Democrat running for governor in Missouri, who also is very supportive of the death penalty. Well, I think it depends a lot on where you are. And Eric mentioned this, and, and that opinions have changed a lot. If we just go back you know, to 1994, not that long ago, 
80 percent of the country supported the death penalty, and significant majorities of Republicans and Democrats supported it. You know, about 70 percent of Democrats supported it, about 80, I think, 9 percent of Republicans supported the death penalty. Today, depending on the survey you look at, it's either going to be a plurality in support where the difference between supporters and, and opponents is, you know, four or five points. We have a massive audience here today who cares about the death penalty. They came out on a gorgeous day to be here for part of a conversation. But in the basket of all of those issues as a political consultant, when a candidate comes to you or in campaigns, has, has the death penalty lost its residency as one of those wedge issues any longer? This is not an issue that has strong majorities on either side. And so it's not an issue that right now politicians, by and large, are using to promote their candidacy, either you know, against the death penalty or for the death penalty. It's, it's an issue that you know, I don't think either side really sees as strong enough to take the case to the people on. Well, many of our politicians go to area churches and synagogues looking for leadership there. And in fact, Adam Hamilton, you wrote a book about confronting the controversies, biblical um, uh, perspectives on tough issues, and did a whole chapter uh, on the death penalty. And there's a line in the book that says, many of those in the legal and criminal justice field look to us, the church, for help in wrestling with this important issue. How are you helping people wrestle with this issue, Reverend Hamilton? Right, well, some of it is talking about and trying to help people understand both sides of this, because you can, from the scripture, make a case on either side. And you've got to then theologize about this. You've got to ask some more deeper, you know, deeper questions as you go into it. Um, but I also think as a pastor, you're pastorally doing this on a regular basis. So uh, I think about in our own congregation, we've had, I believe, five or six people murdered over the last 26 years that I've been pastor there. And when that happens, you're sitting down with people, both in the congregation, but also the immediate family, and you're wrestling with these kinds of questions. And, uh, and on the flip side, as you mentioned earlier, uh, one of our associate pastors is someone who was wrongfully convicted of murder and you realize how easy it is for someone to end up in federal prison for a murder they didn't commit, exonerated after 24 years, gone to seminary, one of our pastors and a, just a dear friend. And, uh, and I think here's one of those people who could very easily have been put to death. And so, uh, so you feel you know, both sides of that. I, I don't think she'd mind me mentioning, but Melinda Corcoran is on the front row. She is one of our parishioners and her husband, Bill Corcoran, Dr. Bill Corcoran and her grandson, Reet, were murdered at the Jewish Community Center on Palm Sunday two years ago. And, uh, you know, sitting in the courtroom uh, during the sentencing phase of the hearing, you know, there's a part of me, I'm listening to this human being who shows no sign of remorse, and there's very little compassion, I feel, in my heart for that particular individual. And uh, at the same time, there are bigger issues that I think we have to be able to talk about. Some of those has to have to do with the 1.4 to 4% to some say even higher uh, persons who are wrongfully convicted of murder, sentenced to, sentenced to death. You were known as a very aggressive prosecutor, Eric Zand. That is your reputation in the metropolitan area. So what, what about those who are wrongfully convicted? Does that give you pause for concern? Well, yeah, well, let me say a couple of things uh, about that. First off, uh, nothing worse can happen to a prosecutor than to convict the wrong person of a crime. The good news about the death penalty is this. That, that in the modern era of the death penalty, if, if we go from the, from the 1940s onward, there's no credible evidence that we have ever executed somebody who was not guilty of their crimes. Now, have there been a number of people who have been released from death row? There have been. And some of those folks were, in fact, factually innocent. Um, and again, a terrible thing that those people were behind bars for any period of time at all. But I will say this, in some ways, that's a sign that the system is working, right? The system is working because we did not execute those people. Again, a terrible injustice that they served any time okay. behind bars well, at all. Let's get Tricia Bushnell's perspective on that. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it, it's- I have a feeling it's gonna be different. <laughs> Slightly. Well, we never know. No, I, I mean, as, so it's an interesting fact. So there, there have been 150 people exonerated from death row. And in, it's interesting that you chose 1940 as the modern era. I would say 1978, which is when the death penalty was reinstated in the United States. Uh, the, there's been about 1,500 executions since then. So we're looking at 10% of people, comparatively, who could have been executed who, who were not. Um, but what we don't think about is what is the system that is, is there and designed to help get people out? 
So if I have a client who's innocent, and, and I'll preface this with, I started in prosecutor's offices. Um, when I was in law school, I went down to work on a death penalty case in Alabama that turned out to be an innocence case that I still have with me now 11 years later. So we've already won him a new trial, but I've lost on appeal, and we're back and forth and back and forth. So he's lost 11 years of his life just of that. But we look at how long this appeals process takes, and we can say, hey, we feel good because some people are getting out. But once someone has died, once we've murdered them, I'm not going to go out and prove their innocence anymore. Once I've lost that claim, I've got other people on death row that need my help. I'm not going to keep trying to prove that. So that, that to me is a false statement. But in addition to that, the death penalty, when it's on the table, leads to greater wrongful convictions in other contexts. Why? So one of the biggest avenues is false confessions. So when the death penalty is on the table, even when it doesn't result in death, the, the, the rate of false confessions goes higher. So we know of the DNA exonerations in the country, 27% of people who are exonerated by DNA falsely confess to a crime they did not commit. That seems crazy to think about. But when you put the death penalty on the table and you only looked at the homicide cases, that rate went up to 67%. Two-thirds people said, I committed a crime I didn't commit because they were afraid of being sentenced to death. Okay, let me ask Eric Zand, let's get his perspective on that. Here's the flip side of that. In Missouri, there are only two sentences for first degree murder. It's either the death penalty or life in prison without the possibility of parole. If we remove the death penalty from the equation, what's going to happen with all of those cases? Any defense lawyer is going to be ethically obligated to try every single one of those cases or if you're going to strike a plea deal, the only plea deal is going to be for second degree murder where the person is going to be eligible for parole. And so what we see is the, the ever-changing, diminishing of punishment for what I think are some really, really serious crimes. So in that sense, he's talking about the death penalty being an important bargaining chip for prosecutors. Are you looking for justice or are you looking for a bargaining tool? And the reality is if you're worried about getting life without parole, well, first of all, we save money because people who are sentenced to death continue to have attorneys on all of their appeals. They are the only folks to get appeals through all of these different stages. Why it's taking 18 years is because they have somebody with them. If you're sentenced to life without parole, you don't have that right for these attorneys continuing, continuing. So that is money saved, right? But that's a discussion we need to have with victims. When we think about making victims whole, it's not just about how do you feel in retaliation. It's how can we help you make you whole? Because murdering someone else is not going to heal that hole. And we find that when we discuss that with victims openly. But for some people, though, Reverend Hamilton, uh, it really doesn't matter because it's an eye for an eye, as the name of this program says. Not just an eye for an eye, but also um, you have killed somebody that I love. I have the opportunity to put you to death. And so you find that in the Hebrew Bible. You find actually 11 crimes for which you could be put to death in the Hebrew Bible. So you, when you start with that, then you go, well, what are the crimes? And of course, those include premarital sex, a man having sex with another man. You know, th there's a whole host of things that we would look at and say, none of us would affirm that, uh, even though those are also in the Bible, uh, violating the Sabbath, encouraging your friend to worship a God other than Yahweh, all of these things would lead you to, uh, allowed for the death penalty. When I'm with people who have lost a loved one, I'm, you know, I have a great deal of compassion for why and I think there are some people for whom they find closure with the death of someone else. I don't think it's always true that people who lost a loved one's loved one find no closure with that. I think some do and some don't. I think what you've said is right that many do not. Some people don't care about all of the nitty gritty details of what's happening with the death penalty other than this fact, Eric Zand. Uh, does it deter crime? Are we deterring people from murdering folks because we have the death penalty? So I would say yes, and, and there are lots of studies um, that suggest that that's true. In fact, in fact, one study that looked at every county in the United States over many, many decades uh, demonstrated that, that for each execution, 18 future murders are deterred. If we believe that some of these statistics, and, and that, there, that there are other folks who, who would argue differently, but if we believe that there's any deterrent effect at all, that we think we could save more than one life by carrying out an execution, what makes those other lives less valuable, those innocent lives less valuable than somebody who almost certainly did a very evil act? Fisher. 
You know, well, one, I would love some fact checks on the on some of those crimes, <laughs> some of those studies, um, because there are certainly studies that that state very clearly the opposite, that it's not a deterrent effect. And it, and it makes sense why that is. So if you look at the history of how the death penalty has evolved in the United States, we are continually finding classes of people we don't execute, which is part of why those numbers are going down. We do not ex execute now uh, kids. We used to execute kids. We used to execute people um, over the age of 16. We don't do that anymore. We used to ex execute folks with intellectual disabilities. We don't do that anymore. So if someone has an IQ of below 70, uh, we, don't, we don't do that. And what we find when we do these studies is that, in fact, over 50% of folks who are on death row have significant intellectual disabilities or mental illness. And so here's why deterrence doesn't work, because it's not going to affect those people. What, when you meet someone who's been on death row and you understand the life that they've had, I mean, I've had clients who um, have been, I mean, these are clients in Missouri, if you read just the case law, their fondest memory of their life was being put in the doghouse with the dog. That was the best moment of their life that they had because they're growing up in these situations where, and this is where I feel very strongly about it, we as society have let people be put in these situations. We didn't care for them when they were children. We didn't care for them when they were ill, when they were being abused, when all these horrible things are happening. So they become uh, addicted, they have mental illness, and these horrible, horrific crimes happen. Let me just say one thing about it. My, my dad was a, was a judge uh, for many years. He, he never um, handed down the death penalty to anybody. But my dad used to say that there's a difference between an explanation for somebody's behavior and an excuse for somebody's behavior. So many of the things that Tricia talks about may be explanations uh, for somebody's behavior. What we've got to decide as a society is whether we're going to allow that to excuse somebody's behavior. And I believe that true mental illness is a, an excuse, and every jury, as we all know, hears about that and gets to make the decision. We have to remember this. It is the most difficult decision I ever make whether to pursue the death penalty. But as a prosecutor, I don't have the power to put anybody on death row. It takes 12 jurors unanimously deciding that somebody has to be placed on death row. If one juror out of those 12 says, no, I don't think so, it doesn't happen. Then it takes the judge in that case to say, I agree with those 12 jurors that this person ought to be handed down the death penalty. And then in Missouri, seven justices of the Missouri Supreme Court also, um, a majority of those judges have to decide that somebody um, uh, has to go on death row. And then the governor, of course, gets his or her choice to determine whether or not to grant clemency. You've got a sense of what our panelists think and where they're weighing up this issue. Now it's time to hear what you have to say. Stephen Steigman, our roving reporter from KCUR News, how say you? I, I say we have a lot of wonderful questions so far. Great. And I'm looking forward to reading more of them. Let's talk a little bit about the cost here of the death penalty. What of the fiscal arguments in favor of repeal of the death penalty? And is it cheaper to keep someone in prison for life compared to the death penalty where it can be almost 20 years full of court cases of appeals? We can look at, at Kansas, which did a recent study, and we can also look at the Nebraska study. But in Kansas, um, they found that the, the trial costs for death for a death case is about $400,000 compared to a, gen a general first degree murder case, which is $100,000. So we're looking at four times the cost just in that. When you put someone in death row, um, the cost to keep them there is about $50,000 a year versus the cost to house someone just in prison is about $25,000 per year. So over the time, we're looking at one point, they estimate 1.3 million or around that amount just for the cost of the death penalty being on the table. Um, those are substantial questions that we have to ask where do we want that money to go? Where do we feel that that is best served? You know, it's a very utilitarian view about how to implement government policy or you know, whether there should be a death penalty or not. And so you know, I, don't, I don't know that proponents of the death penalty are motivated by a utilitarian view. I think they, they have a more you know, moral view about somebody has committed a heinous crime, and so there's a certain penalty that is justified in that. I agree completely with what Terry just said. I have considered a myriad of factors when I determine whether or not to pursue the death penalty against someone. The one factor I've never considered and will never consider is how much is this going to cost? Uh, for two reasons. First off, I don't think that's the right way to look at it. As, as, as Terry talks about, I think there are considerations um, that come from a moral viewpoint that say the utilitarian um, concerns aren't the most important concerns. But secondly, I know this, that it's the tactic of the criminal defense bar to try to make the death penalty so expensive that nobody will ever carry it out. 
And that, I think, is wrong. I, I won't be bullied into not pursuing the death penalty. More questions from our audience here in the auditorium of the Kansas City Plaza Library straight ahead. But first, a closer look at the death penalty by the numbers. Another couple of questions here about crime rates in states with the death penalty. Are crime rates, murder rates, lower in states with a death penalty? And does life without parole have as much or more impact as the death penalty? I don't have exact numbers on that, but generally, no, they are not any different in, in, in states that have the death penalty. Um, I think it's hard, it's hard for us as folks who do not experience many of these things in our lives to think about whether or not life without parole or the death penalty is a deterrent. I think it's hard because we are rational folks doing rational things. But people who are doing very horrible crimes are not rational folks doing rational things. Let me give you just one story uh, that Senator Dianne Feinstein um, tells. Uh, some of you may know that, that before becoming a U.S. senator for a time, Dianne Feinstein was a member of the parole board in the state of California. She tells a story about a, a, a woman um, who robbed a bank and she had an unloaded weapon um, when she robbed that bank. And during her parole hearing, uh, Senator Feinstein asked her, why didn't you load the gun? And her answer was, I didn't put bullets in the gun because I was afraid I might panic and shoot somebody, and I didn't want to risk the death penalty. Well, that's, that's a story, a real story from a real person who is saying, I acted differently because of the threat of the death penalty. Whether you believe in the moral arguments for the death penalty or against it, one of the newest avenues and the news headlines for the death penalty in our neck of the woods and in the state of Missouri is whether we can even continue to do it because of the inability to be able to get execution drugs to allow lethal injection to take place. Um, could the death penalty, rather than anything to do with moral arguments or cost or deterrence, end up falling of its own weight because we can't even get the drugs to make that happen, Eric Zahn. In the end, I don't, I, I don't think so because the, there, are, there are other mechanisms um, that the state could use um, to carry out the death penalty. Um, in, in the past, um, states have used the firing squad. You could bring back the firing squad, but there are other ways that, that are actually um, uh, sort of, uh, I think folks would find um, uh, uh, less troubling. For example, uh, the administration of nitrogen gas. Nitrogen gas is a, is a product that is very easy to get, um, and, and when inhaled, um, uh, what the, the, uh, the uh, studies that I've read um, show that it causes death very quickly and very painlessly. Um, and so there will almost certainly be some mechanism, even if we run short of the execution drugs that we're using now. But the state of Missouri did introduce a bill in the 2014 legislature to, to enact a firing squad. It didn't go anywhere. It did not, but it could someday. Okay. Tricia. I think one of the interesting things about this question is um, why we're even thinking about going back to the firing squad and that we're executing people anyway. So uh, one of the things I think you're alluding to, and I don't know that everyone in this room knows, so the drug that was traditionally used in the three-drug cocktail, a pentobarbital, the manufacturers of that drug are out of Europe and they said, we will no longer sell this drug for purposes of execution. So if you want to execute someone, you can't use this. So other states had to figure out, what are we going to use to execute people? Many states moved to midazolam, uh, and there's questions about whether or not that's humane and lots of things. But irrespective of that, Missouri continued on with executions. So then there's been a lot of litigation of what drug is Missouri using? And it's come out through various different documents is they're using pentobarbital. So then the question is, 
where are we getting it from? Because we know that these people will not sell it. And in the latest litigation, what's come out is Missouri pays for this drug in cash. So we don't even know where it's coming from. Um, you know, you're, well, why is that so important to you to know that? Well, it, it's important for a number of reasons. One, if, if the manufacturer is saying that they won't sell it for this, that could imply that it's being received in nefarious ways, right? There are people who are sitting in federal penitentiaries for stealing drugs or using drugs in ways that they aren't. So if that's something, is that something that we as citizens want our state to do? that we allow in our name to break this other law or to do these other things for the purposes of committing the death penalty. And that is a, a question that, you know, it's, it's a moral one, it's a citizen citizenry question that we need to address. But these are the lengths that we're willing to go through. We think, we don't know, we don't even know. We don't even know what our state is using to kill people. But, but didn't the state court of appeals just rule that the state did not have to in any way release the information on where they were getting the drugs, what physicians they were using, what pharmacists they were using, that could all be concealed. That's right. And what's interesting is one of the reasons we even have any of this information wasn't because of Missouri lit litigation. It was from litigation in Mississippi, where they got the drugs from Missouri. And then in Mississippi, they said, well, Mississippi, we get to know where you got those drugs from. So there's a lot of things moving along and going through that we just were trying to figure out. Oklahoma also had a referendum or initiative ballot measure on this this past year, partly out of this issue about what is going to be the mechanism of execution. And the, you know, the question on the, on, the, on the Oklahoma ballot was, number A, that you know, uh, the death penalty could not be defined as cruel and unusual under the state constitution, but also giving authority to the state legislature to find that if, or if it was found that any method of execution was unconstitutional, that they could institute another method. And so, some states are moving forward to try to deal with this issue. And as Eric said, I think Utah has put um, the firing squad in place uh, in, in the case. You know, but, but I do think that you know, there was, a, there was a, a political ripple on the death penalty when a number of states tried to use alternate um, means of lethal and alternate drugs for lethal injection and failed or had great difficulty in actually um, performing the execution, which became public. And I think a lot of people were concerned about it. It's part of, I think, what's driven some of the skepticism in the, in the polling. Straight ahead on an eye for an eye, who is most likely to be executed? And is race really a factor? But first, Mike Sherry and Brad Austin from KCPT's digital magazine Flatland take a closer look at the renewed scrutiny of Missouri's choice of execution. The state's power to execute people is one of the most serious powers granted. And we think it's important that the public know what the government is doing when it decides to execute somebody and use this ultimate power. The dominant process in the beginning used three different lethal, or three different drugs as a three drug cocktail. Uh, the first was an anesthetic that in theory put you to sleep. The second was a paralytic so that you couldn't move. And whenever we've looked into why the paralytic, uh, and it was essentially to keep the witnesses from being traumatized if anything would go wrong. Um, you know, it's a crime in 38 states to use a paralytic to euthanize an animal. Um, so it raises some real uh, questions about how humane the process is. Because drug number three is a caustic chemical, usually potassium chloride, that stops the heart. Uh, but if you were conscious at the time potassium chloride is injected into your veins, it would be an excruciating burning sensation. You would feel as if you were being burned alive from the inside. Uh, we've seen cases in Missouri in which something goes wrong with the insertion of the needle. So we've had people go into convulsions, we've had people slowly suffocate. We've had other cases where veins have collapsed and they had to do a surgical cut down and it was just a bloody mess. A lot of our drugs, in fact, virtually all of our drugs of this nature were manufactured in Europe. Um, Europe is you know, overwhelmingly, monolithically opposed to capital punishment and uh, it was a crime for European drug companies to sell drugs to the US for purposes of use in lethal injections. And so that cut off our supply of manufactured drugs. Uh, and then they've got to come up with another drug source. And that's the controversy. Where are these drugs coming from that they're using? 
We represent a group of media outlets, both national and local media folks, who have been attempting for years now to find out where the state of Missouri is buying the drugs that it uses to execute people in the state of Missouri. We've asked for the commercial entity somewhere in this country or elsewhere who's getting paid in real U.S. cash dollars. It's no different than any other vendor that the state of Missouri has that it pays cash to or it writes a check to or it sends a wire transfer to. We don't know if they're buying them from an individual. Uh, we don't know if they're buying from a company. We don't know if they're buying from someone in Missouri. We don't know anything about where they're buying from. That's what we've asked for, and that's what the state has refused to give us. According to the state, there's either one or a true, true handful number of suppliers. And if the supply is that limited, that means you can charge whatever price you want. That can't be a wise expenditure of my tax dollars. Does the public have a right to know where the state of Missouri is getting its drugs to execute prisoners? I don't think so. Um, and and, and that, that, that just falls under the Missouri Sunshine um, Law about what's a public record and what's not. Um, there's a lot of detail in those court decisions, but Missouri courts have spoken and said the answer to that is no. What to you, you know, because people get concerned about, you know, this is cruel and unusual punishment. That's one of the arguments made about lethal injection. I mean, what, what to you make something cruel and unusual punishment? Well, if it's not lethal injection. Right. So, so um, you know, it's, it's sort of like the definition of, of pornography, right? I don't know. I, I can't exactly tell you what it is, but I know when I see it. I think that's, I think that's where we are right now um, with this idea of what constitutes cruel and unusual punishment. Our United States Supreme Court has talked about these, these evolving standards of decency so that some things that, that, that years ago we might not have said would be cruel and unusual we might say are cruel and unusual um, today. Again, what, what I would suggest is, I think there are ways um, to carry out executions that virtually everybody would agree um, is not uh, cruel and unusual, unless you're just against it for every single reason under any circumstance. Stephen. We had a question here. Is the death penalty really a deterrent if, if murder is usually a crime of passion? It is not going to deter. Um, crimes uh, of passion, and it's really not intended to. Because remember, the death penalty can only be used, not even in all murder cases, it can only be used in murder cases, but not all, and in fact, not most murder cases. They first have to be a first-degree murder, that is a premeditated murder, a murder that is carried out with deliberation, which by its very definition has to be something that somebody has thought about. So it's not going to deter all of these other crimes of passions and, and the many, many um, uh, murders that are second degree murders that happen without any premeditation at all. Now, you were on a task force with the Missouri Association of uh, Prosecuting Attorneys that was looking at the death penalty and how you could speed up the whole process, including reducing the number of appeals, which some people believe if there were fewer appeals, if this happened in a shorter period of time between sentence and execution, it would have more of a deterrent effect. So what did you actually find? And did any changes take place or were any recommendations made to help speed up that process? So no changes have taken place in Missouri as a result of it. As Terry points out, California is moving in that direction. And, and I think it is undeniably true. Um, that, that there are ways to both streamline the death penalty and also assure um, uh, the, the public and people um, who are sentenced to death that, that we can carry out um, uh, the death penalty with the strictest due process that we have. And I, listen, understand that I'm a believer in, in applying uh, the absolute greatest scrutiny we can apply uh, to these cases. Again, because the worst nightmare would be that we ac actually execute somebody who was not guilty of their crime. I would even be willing to do this. I would trade some higher burden of proof. You know, uh, in all criminal cases now, the burden of proof is proof beyond a reasonable doubt. I'm not exactly sure how we would, we would word a burden of proof that is higher than that. Perhaps it's, it's, it's uh, proof that, that overcomes any lingering doubt or something like that. But, but cases where we know, basically, beyond really any shadow of a doubt that this person killed the, this other person or these other people in this way, I would be willing to trade that for a shorter appeal time. I appreciate that. I was thinking about the fact that, the, it, if I remember correctly, an inordinate number of people who are executed tend to be poorer people. 
and I don't know if that's true nation, nation, nationally or if you would say that's true in Missouri. Last time I checked, this was the case. And so many of those are persons who are not afforded, who are not able to afford the kind of defense. And so I think now to the associate pastor at our church, Daryl Burton, whose, uh, whose trial lasted a very short period of time with an attorney who met with him briefly before going into the court hearing. And, and again, then fighting to try to get somebody to take his case after he's in prison for, you know, now he wasn't sentenced to death. Uh, he was sentenced to life in prison. But uh, fortunately, there was an organization that, that eventually took his case. That took 24 years. And so, you know, Mike, the one concern I have, you talk about the higher, uh, you know, standard for conviction, but at the same time, you've got to somehow be able to provide legal representation for the poor who are inordinately convicted of these crimes in order to give them the kind of defense that would allow that to happen, it's, it seems it, to me. It's a valid concern. Let me tell you my experience on it, and I'm going to see if I can get Tricia to agree with me on something on this or not. I don't know whether I'll, I will succeed or not. Um, but I would say this, that in Missouri, I would submit that perhaps the best death penalty litigators are the death penalty litigators um, for Missouri's Public Defenders Capital Unit. They are phenomenal lawyers who do tre a tremendous job for their clients. I believe they have the most experienced and best death penalty lawyers um, in the state of Missouri. I also know this with certainty, that anybody who is charged with the death penalty um, anywhere in the United States in today's world is going to have some of the best lawyers in the country volunteering uh, to take their cases for free. Okay, so is that something you're agreeing on, Tricia? Uh, absolutely not. <laughs> okay, all right. And, uh, and, and it's interesting, because I thought you were gonna go somewhere else, and I was like, I bet I am gonna agree, but we didn't go. Uh, Missouri is ranked 49th in the country for funding for public defenders. Um, and that's a problem, it is. They're overworked, they don't have the capacity, and I can tell you just from my docket of innocence cases, there's, there are things that are significantly lacking because they don't have the resources they need. Um, I will also preface with, as I said, I've worked in Alabama. Alabama doesn't have a public defender system, so we're ranked 49th. Um, you, but, but what we also, you know, we mentioned that folks who are getting sentenced to death, they're poor folks and they're folks of color. And we need to talk about that because I think what's interesting and where I thought you were going is we're talking a lot about prosecutorial discretion, right? And if in a hypothetical world we had only great prosecutors, we might end up somewhere differently. But we're not gonna end up in that place because I can tell you just from working in innocence cases, people make mistakes, people that um, maybe shouldn't be where they are are elected. And what we look at when we look at, there are four counties where the vast majority of all death cases come out of. I agree, if we had a world of only amazing, great people, then this would be a discussion on purely moral grounds. Well, if we had a world of only amazing, great people, we wouldn't need the death penalty, would we? <laughs> Um, sadly, that's not the world that we live in. Um, well, let me say one thing uh, uh, about race, because race is important. And, and, and there is a racial disparity in the death penalty. And it is this. If you are a person who is any other color than African American, than black, you are more likely, it, a, a, having been charged with first degree murder, to be convicted of the death penalty than if you are black. I was that's, just looking at the latest figures. That's true in Missouri, that's true okay. nationally. Okay, well, let's just look at this. The latest figures from the Death Penalty Information Center, I just looked this up before we came. That since 1976, whites make up 55.7% of all those executed in America? Right, but not, not the number of people who are on death row, right? So it's over 70% of folks who are on death row. Um, and in fact, and if you look at exonerations, it's over 70% of folks who are exonerated are people of color. Um, we know, and, and you know, there's so many factors of race that go into it. We look at prosecutors. So in death cases, of all death cases that ever had, 1% uh, of those prosecutors have been black, 1% have been Latino, the other 98% have been white prosecutors. Kansas just got their very first black prosecutor in the entire state, Mark Dupree in Wyandotte County. I mean, race plays a role in this decision-making process. We know from the studies, from the Baldus studies, that if it is a black person who has, com has committed a crime against a white person, that is what is statistically more likely to get you death than anything else. Yeah, I want to go back to Stephen in a moment, but you mentioned Kansas. But why is it, because we've focused a lot on Missouri, but they reinstated the death penalty in 1994, 10 people on death row, never executed anyone. That's right. Why is that? A lot of it is because of errors that have continually happened. So, 
this process is so long and there's so many people, there are so many errors, and that's what I was saying at the beginning. So 68% of all death, you're, you, you've been, we've, we, the jury, have found you guilty and we want, or you're sentencing you to death. 68% of those will have that death sentence taken away because of all of the errors that happened along the way. And in Kansas, recently up until the Carr brothers, the Kansas Supreme Court has continued to say, no, we found an error, we found an error, we found an error, we found an error, such that folks thought the death penalty was gonna end in Kansas because there were so many errors. Then the Carr brothers case um, went up to the US Supreme Court, they said we didn't find any errors and they sent it back down and that has reignited, invigorated this debate in Kansas. Does that show that the process is working though? I, the, the, the problem is, I mean, here's the thing. If you talk to someone who's represented enough people on death row, I will tell you we know someone who is innocent who was executed. Can we prove it? No, they're dead. I don't even have standing to get into court. I can't even go to court and get someone and say, hey, hear this case, because they're going to say there's no jurisdiction, there's no standing, this is moot. So we can't prove that statistic. We can't meet it. We'll never have that ability. All we can do is show the ones that we're winning for. Let's be clear, though, about what 68% of the cases being overturned means. It does not mean that those folks are factually innocent. In fact, in many of the cases, there's no question about the guilt of, of the defendant, and yet the cases are being reversed for some instructional error, perhaps some error in argument or something like this, but no question that the person who committed the crime um, is guilty. So, so we just have to understand what that 68% statistic means. It doesn't mean that all those folks are factually innocent. Adam. I was just gonna say, uh, now speaking on a, out of a different side of my mouth here, uh, to raise a point that hasn't been raised yet, but uh, I received an email from one of my parishioners this week, uh, today, who, has, uh, who had a friend who was killed in the Carr Brothers case. And, and then thinking about her, one of the survivors in this and the fear that if this person, these persons weren't put to death and if they were ever released or if they escaped or just this fear of what would happen I, I raise that as a no, concern a that some people have so who are victims all, of these crimes. So is it always life sentence without parole? Are there circumstances where somebody has, did not get the death penalty, they were life sentence without parole, and were then somehow released? O only if the sentence is commuted by the governor of the state of Missouri, or the case is reversed on appeal for some other reason. Stephen Steigman, our roving reporter from KC1 News. Now a very personal story we have here in the audience. Melinda Corcoran wanted to make sure we air this comment here, that there's a difference in death row incarceration versus life imprisonment uh, in the general population. Death row in Kansas keeps prisoners from continuing to spew their hate-baiting message, and this was very important to their family. And I don't mean to sound flippant here, but we do have a couple of questions about why do we stop death row inmates from committing suicide? If anything, it speaks to the bizarreness of the death penalty system, right? So if you have, if you, um, are ill and you are sick and you need health care, we will make you whole before we kill you. You need a kidney transplant to be good, we'll pay for that and we'll make you whole so that we can kill you. Because we need to know that you are in good enough health for these drugs to work appropriately so we can kill you. Um, if you. If you are mentally ill and do not appreciate that you are going to die, we can medicate you until you are well enough to understand that you're going to die and then we can kill you. Reverend Hamilton. Yeah, I just want to uh, come back to Melinda's comment because I thought it was really important. And, uh, and that might speak to a broader issue that has to be addressed when it comes to prosecution and, and, uh, and the fact that people who are experiencing, who have been sentenced to life in prison without parole, still have the possibility of inflicting harm upon their victims following that. Uh, so I just would say so this is a, the case of the man who killed three people at the village Shalom and the Jewish community center. That's correct. You were uh, quoted in the newspaper uh, Alexander's talking about uh, whether somebody who was at the end of their life, wh was it worth prosecuting a death penalty case if they've only got a year left to live? Yeah, I, 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 it's my belief that, again, if a society is going to have the death penalty, which both the state of Missouri and the state of Kansas have decided they are, um, that, again, one of the considerations that, that we shouldn't um, take into mind is, might this person die? That could happen to anybody at any time. But if we've decided that that is going to be the full measure of justice and um, a prosecutor um, in conjunction with the victim's family has decided that in this case we're going to pursue that, I don't think the fact that that, that person may die before it's ever carried out um, is a valid consideration. 
Let, let me talk, though, about something. We, as we talk about this issue between life in prison, even life in prison without the possibility of parole and the death penalty, there's one other consideration that I think we have to think about, and that is if somebody is already serving a life sentence, what deters them from attacking other inmates or, or guards if we don't have the death penalty? And there are, uh, there's a very respected um, prison warden who has said, we've got to have the death penalty um, to protect the people who work for me. How do we know that the death penalty is what's deterring all of these people serving life without parole from killing folks if we don't have it? Well, I'm sure we could look at states that have life without parole uh, and see what their rate is for folks who are on, that, that don't have the death penalty and see what their rates are for murders by people serving life without parole for on other inmates and other guards. I, I can't imagine that they're very high because, you know, having had experience with how limited those cases are anyway, I, you can't prove it. Um, but, but I will say this. It is also a mistake to believe that because people are in prison, they don't have communities, that they don't live as people, that they don't have friends, that they don't make friends with guards, that they don't care about people because they're in prison. We're talking about people in prison not animals, not something else. It's not, oh, there's this deterrence, so if only because of that deterrence, they're not just running around stabbing everyone else. No, they're living their lives, and it's the only life they've got behind bars, and they want to experience friendship and have a future and have an education. So that's certainly a strong, powerful emotion to me why people don't go killing other people. Steven Steigman. Another question we receive, which is about the long-term impact of execution on the jurors who impose the death penalty and those who carry out executions. There have certainly been studies on, a, on attorneys, on both prosecutors and defense, and also forensic scientists on the impact of the job on folks, um, very high levels of depression, suicide, secondary stress, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, but I don't, I don't know of any particular on the jurors. There was one story, as you're talking about executioners, talking about the fallibility of the firing squad, and they were talking about Utah where five people are chosen to, um, to, to do the execution and that uh, each officer would potentially shoot away from the heart because they didn't want to be the person to actually kill the, the inmate. Yeah, my sense is there are probably better ways to mete out the death penalty than bringing back the firing squad. Um, again, um, we, we've talked about what, what some of those might be, um, but but... At the end of the day, there is this instinct of folks that we want to set the scales right in some ways. And I think about it like this. Let's say um, we, we caught a rapist, um, but through, the, through some miracle of science, we could give that rapist a drug that would ensure that he would never, ever commit another rape in his life at all. Would, would we then say, that's fine, you don't need to be called to account for what you've done? I think many of us in this room would say, no, no, that person's already committed a crime and something needs to happen. There needs to be some punishment as a result of that. Eric offered you uh, an olive branch a little earlier, uh, though you didn't agree with what he said. Is there an olive branch you could offer to uh, Eric in a sense of, is there any crime that you think that actually could, in your view, justify the death penalty? I understand why people want the death penalty. I understand why people cry out for it. Um, and, and, you know... But there's no circumstance? But the question is this to me. How many times can the state mess up before we say we don't get to do it anymore? So 150 people have been exonerated from death row. 150. And you talked about errors that are not innocence errors, the so 68%, and I agree with you. But they're fairness errors. We're saying that this error made this trial unfair. And so we have to get rid of this death sentence. Nick, Nick, let me try to sharpen your hypothetical a little bit and see whether, and I won't ask Tricia to answer this question, but I'll ask people here, not even to raise your hand, but answer it in your own mind. Let's say you were the chief of the Kansas City Police Department and a man had taken over a classroom with 18 children um, in that classroom. Um, he had um, a gun with him and told you that he was going to start shooting on the hour one of those children um, every single hour. When the first hour rolled by, he shoots one of those children dead. As you're coming up on the second hour, um, your sharpshooter comes to you and says, if you give me the command, I am certain that
that I can shoot this man and uh, that we will put an end to the likelihood that 17 more children would die. Ask yourself, if you were the chief of police of Kansas City, would you give the order uh, for that sharpshooter to shoot that wrongdoer? But in this case, what you're really talking about is that's a self-defense, that's defending those children. In the no. other case, you've got somebody who isn't going to do any more harm. You put them behind bars, life in prison without parole. I mean, I, I'm, I'm just saying yeah, those seem a, like two different So, so I mean, I'm, 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 I'm really glad that you say that. Not if we believe the study, this huge panel study of 3,054 counties across the United States that says for each execution that we carry out, we deter 18 future murders. Now, we might not know who those 18 people are. We don't know the names of those 18 victims. But does that make those 18 victims any less worthy of our support than the 18 children in that classroom who we know? And it's because of those types of scenarios why many politicians end up saying they are for the death penalty because they always see examples, including in our last presidential race, uh, Terry Nelson, uh, both Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton said they were in favor of the death penalty. Right. They, they were both in favor of the death penalty. And you know, I think it's, it's conventional wisdom. I think there's truth to it that being tough on crime is usually a good way for politicians to go. Four different voices, ladies and gentlemen, on the death penalty. Our thanks to our panel. We're going to present each of our panelists with a civility bell of their own engraved uh, so they can use those in their respective uh, offices. And thank you for being such a civil audience. Thank you so much, and good night. Thank you for watching An Eye for an Eye right here on KCPT. Hello, I'm Nick Haynes. It's one of those moments where we lift up the hood and spend the time looking at a complex issue right here in Kansas City. We did it recently looking at the crime issue in Kansas City and what was happening with the systemic issues of why we have so many murders in this community. We'll be doing it again in April when we look at infrastructure and all of the problems of aging infrastructure in this community with a major town hall. We can do these hour-long programs thanks to your support. I'm with uh, Randy Mason, who also appreciates the fact that here at KCPT, we have this rare opportunity to spend time on these um, these important issues. Yeah, and offer insights and thorough analysis of things, whether they are in the arts or, as Nick says, in some pressing community issues. And we think, in fact, we know it's all made possible by viewers like you who believe that that's a necessary thing to have on the dial. So as we're here, we want to offer some opportunities for you to become a member at a great sustaining level of $7 a month, which will bring you in return some things. In fact, you're holding one of them. Yeah, absolutely. I was just looking at our new magazine that's just come out, telling you all about our infrastructure project, looking at waters and sewers and bridges and all the problems around the future of our transit in Kansas City. You can get that coming to you at the $7 a month level. It tells you about all of the programs and excellent articles. Uh, also, a fabulous new tote bag that we have available It's now. time for a new one. You know, we're out there in the world. I often see people carrying various versions. We talk about how important public television is to them. And I think this is that great chance for you if you enjoy, as we're saying, the, the coverage you get here on KCPT, to give it back. $7 a month as a sustaining member. Also, the Passport, which is a great library of uh, public television programs that will stream to you. You get that as part of the deal as well. And our KCPT Plus card. Yeah, and that's discounts to area uh, theaters and uh, other cultural attractions all across our metropolitan area when you support us at $7 a month and we thank you for doing so. We can't do it without your support. Thank you.